Excellent. Greetings, everyone, and thanks so much for taking the time to join us today for what promises to be another cracking virtual tour, this time through northern Peru. Amazingly, tonight will be our 12th webinar. I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank all of you for your continued support of our webinars, our tour leaders, and Rock Jumper as a whole. We love being able to showcase some of our world's most spectacular destinations and are grateful to all of you for signing up each week. All of your feedback is also sincerely appreciated. For those of you who know me, you'll probably recall that I enjoy the facts and figures, and so does Nikki in a big way. And today I just wanted to let all of you know that we have had just over 1,800 people sign up for at least one of our webinars over the past three months. None of us could have ever expected this amount of support, so a big thank you from all of us at Rock Jumper. On to the webinar itself. As always, we love fielding your questions, so please feel free to ask away. We may not be able to answer every question live, but we'll do our level best. To ask a question, say hi, or provide feedback, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen or else the chat function. So joining Nikki and I today is Rob Williams, one of our most traveled and well-regarded tour leaders, and also one of Peru's most experienced birders. Some of you may be wondering why Rob is only talking about one part of the country and not the whole of Peru, as we usually discuss the country as a whole during these webinars. The reason really is that Peru has so many species and such a wide diversity that to cover the entire country in one go would be impossible. And to really get a good overview of all of Peru's species, one would need to do at least three different tours to the country. So Rob has had a lifelong interest in birds, which all started with one of his earliest memories when he watched a sparrowhawk kill, pluck, and eat a starling at the tender age of just four. Thereafter, he became completely obsessed with South America when he read a book about the Amazon. This was when he was just seven years old, and at that time, also made the decision to go and work on the continent, which he's done for many, many years with multiple visits, and also included an 11-year stint where he lived in Peru between 2003 and 2013. His first South American experience was in Ecuador, right down near the Peruvian border, while his first three visits to Peru were actually illegal as the border was closed, so he ended up swimming across the border river. Talk about commitment. During his time in Peru, Rob spent three years in the north of the country working to help a local community establish the Chapari Reserve, and overseeing the white-winged guan reintroduction program there. He then spent eight years in Cusco, managing a large conservation program in the Andes and Amazon, including Manu National Park. Rob has, sorry, Rob has also written several books, with his latest being a book on hummingbirds that he is, he is still busy completing. Finally, given Rob's immense knowledge of Peru's birds and the volume of time he has spent exploring the country, he's racked up a seriously impressive country list with just over 1,700 species seen. To get to that sort of number, you have to be extremely focused and also have the will to venture to some very off the beaten track parts of the country. One such example is from a, a couple of years ago when he walked 117 kilometers to see the rare and seldom recorded yellow-brown toucanet, which occurs in largely inaccessible forests along the east slopes of the Andes in northern Peru. I really could go on and on, but I think it's time to hear from the man himself. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the virtual tour you're about to embark on. Rob, over to you. Great, thank you very much indeed, Keith, for those very kind words. Um, and welcome everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here, uh, virtually talking to you about northern Peru today. So the trip from northern Peru is a trip that goes right across the country from the Pacific to the heart of the Amazon basin, really. And it's an amazing thing. So we'll, we'll start off with a little bit of information about Peru. Most people, when they think about Peru, think about Machu Picchu. Uh, down in southern Peru, one of the new seven wonders of the world, a world heritage site. Fantastic place to visit and a great place that you can add on to the southern Peru trip. But what the focus on Machu Picchu has done is that many people, especially conventional tourists, have ignored northern Peru for a long time. And from a burning point of view, it has an awful lot to offer. So here's a picture of, um, the, the, of South America, the western part of South America, showing mostly Peru. In the sort of sat, the bottom center, you'll see a large lake. That's Lake Titicaca on the Bolivian border. 
But if you look up to the westernmost point, so the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see a whitish area of coastal desert. That's the Satura Desert up in northern Peru. And you'll see the Andes going across to the right from there are very um, broken up, lots of ridges. It's a, a Geologically, uh, it's known as a, an area of Cordilleran chaos. And that's one of the important things we're going to come back to on why northern Peru is just such an amazing birding area. So, but thinking about the whole of Peru, it's a staggering 1,848 species. That's following the IOC taxonomy that Rock Jumper uses. At the bottom, you can see the comparative taxonomies for um, eBird, etc. And it, there's not a huge amount of difference, really. Um, of those 1,848, 128 endemics are endemic to the country and there's another 126 that are very nearly endemic to the country just creeping into neighboring countries. So it really is a staggering number of birds. Um, just to give you an idea of how that pans out in some of the sort of more popular families, here are the numbers for some of those families. You can see, I mean, 243 flycatchers, that's a massive selling point for the country. 186 uh, tanagers, 128 hummingbirds, etc. Really incredible diversities in some of these very popular families. Peru also has an awful lot to offer in terms of archaeology and cultural interests. There's over 7,000 registered archaeological sites in the country. I've so here selected pictures that represent birds from three different cultures from northern Peru, the Chachapoyas up at the top, left with a, this is in Grand Pajaten archaeological site uh, from the Sikan culture of gold and bird and then a couple of bits of Mochica pottery. The bottom right one seeming to show a white winged guan and the bottom left an Andean condor. And you can combine the birding with a bit of culture as well or add on some trips, it's really worth doing. Um, so now we're going to bring in ourselves into northern Peru. And of those 1,848 species we talked about, there's over 1,600 species available in northern Peru, including 59 Peru endemics and another 100 or 150 bird species there, which are restricted range. These may be shared with other countries as well, but they are global endemics with, you know, the Tumbesian endemics, the Moranian Valley endemics and things. And so, you know, a staggering number of really special species up there. And there's similar endemism in other taxa as well. This is um, a, a, a satellite image, a Google Earth image actually, of the area of northern Peru that we cover on the tours. The white points show the main birding localities. And the tours basically work from the right hand side near the town of Tarapoto. We cross over into this very green area going up into the eastern Andes. And then there's various ridges there we explore. We then go across to the top center, um, slightly left of center near the town of Hayen, which is at the, um, the lower Moranian Valley. You can see that gray sort of gash running slightly diagonally down through the middle of the Andes. That's the Moranian Valley, a very important biogeographical divide and a habitat in its own right. You then double back a little bit to um, head down that way and bird through the Moranian Valley and up into the highlands of Cajamarca before dropping down to the coast and going slightly north to the Chapar to Chiclayo and then slightly inland to the Chaparí area and then finally we drop back down to Trujillo for our last couple of birding sites. It's a really comprehensive route that we've fine-tuned over a number of years to really maximize the birding itineraries. This is the road network laid on at that same kind of scale. And you can see what's considered, considered the traditional Northern Peru birding road, just highlighted in yellow, which we do most of. And then we double back and come down that red road to the Cajamarca Highlands before nipping down to the coast and going back up to get the coastal bit. Because it's basically a T-shape, you have to duplicate some bit of the route but we are minimizing the the bit we duplicate i think for this itinerary and optimizing the the birding opportunities um a lot of people are concerned about altitude when they go to the andes and this is an elevational or two elevational transects showing the the elevation along those roads we would be starting in the top diagram right over on the left hand side at terrapoto 
um, just above the 700 kilometer mark. That's the road kilometers. And you can see we work our way across. So we're only, um, we're just under 500 meters elevation there. And it takes us nearly a week to get to um, a lodge at just over 2000 meters at Abra Patricia. And then we drop back down to high end and then we come into the bottom road and we take it from left to right. So uh, it takes nearly another week before we end up getting to our highest points on the tour at just over 3,600 and 3,700 meters, which these are passes we only visit very briefly. And so altitude is really not a problem. The highest places we sleep on the tour are just over 2,500 meters, but that's after nearly two weeks and everyone is well adapted. So this is one, another reason for doing the tour this way around. Right, well, let's get on and do a bit of the tour. I'm gonna to start off with the pre-tour extension, which is offered. This is a three night trip um, to the Cordillera Azul. Uh, there's a picture looking towards the Cordillera Azul. You can see the bluish hue of the, the Blue Ridge. And um, this is an outlying ridge of mountains in the Amazon. And um, these are very ancient rocks. These mountains predate the Andes rising up. And so they're an isolated ridge and they've got several endemics on them, uh, especially scarlet banded barbet um, and a suite of other hard to see species that you know, are not available on the main tour. The total number of birds we get on this extension is usually a couple of hundred, but it includes some very good ones. Here's that same map again. If you look down at the red bird in the bottom right corner, as I show these maps, always the red bird logo will show the area I'm talking about in that section of the talk. So we're heading down to the, the little village of Plataforma uh, in the Cordillera Azul. The, we drive down through the Huayaga Valley, and this is an area of uh, very important rice production. And we'll take some time to look at some of the water birds that occur in the rice field. Here's a photo with both white-backed on the left and black-necked spilt on the right. And you can see the, the difference is the one on the right, the black-necked, is a juvenile, and the white-backed's an adult. I couldn't get two adults together, unfortunately. But a very different bird, you know, these previously been lumped, but I mean, just look at the thickness of the bill on the, the white back stilt. It's, it's nice to see a few white back stilts in amongst the common black neck stilts there. We also look for crakes and rails, and it's a good area to try and find a tricky paint build crake. This is one that crossed in front of the vehicle last year uh, with a couple of chicks as we were heading up. And then as we come into the foothills of the Cordillera, we, we pick up some interesting birds. This is Mishana terranulate. And Mishana terranulate is a, a recently described species that only lives on weathered nutrient deficient soils and these ancient rocks. So that's one of the indicators that this is really our ancient sandstone ridges here. Um, we also pick up sought after birds like Amazonian umbrella bird can be found along there. Um, this is quite a, a tricky trip though. I mean, it's it's a, a bit gung-ho, this extension. This is from the first time Rock Jumper went up there in 2014. The road has improved since then, um, but you do need welly boots. It can be a bit muddy. It's very, it rains a lot up there. Uh, and we travel up in these uh, four-wheel drive pickups that have been massively raised up suspension. Uh, last year it was much, it was about half the time because they've improved the road way up into the mountains. I was very impressed how they improved them. But, you know, it is still going off the beaten track slightly. And we're, we're aiming for this little community here. You can see to the upper right, the little village of Plataforma, um, which is an area that the forest is being fragmented as there's agriculture developing, there's coffee plantations, bananas, etc. But there's still good forest fragments and we use that. This is the main square of the village. Um, some kids playing football in the pouring rain, having a, a great time. Um, as I said, this is you know, not a luxury trip. It's very good for the birds, but that's the hotel at the back, the little orange building. Uh, that lovely young couple who run it cook us very well cooked, nice, simple food, but it's all perfectly safe, etc. But it is shared bathrooms and just want everyone to really know what to expect if you go. It's only three nights. They do have internet, um, but it is, um, you know, it's a frontier town, but it's surrounded by this most magnificent forest. Um, these amazing forests with some really great birds in. 
Obviously our main target is uh, the scarlet banded barbet which we have to walk a bit on some muddy logging trails and things, but we, we've always managed to find it. Um, it's a fabulous bird, only recently described, and it's the cover bird on the Birds of Peru book. Um, really good. There's also the recently discovered Cordillera Azul uh, antbird, which we look for, and uh, a suite of other good birds can be found up there, like this blue rump mannequin, at night we can look for birds like Rufescent Screech Owl and also Foothill Screech Owl and the rare Subtropical Pygmy Owl. Okay, so now that, that's the extension. We'll now go back to Tarapoto to start the main tour. And from here on, it's all very nice hotels and lodges, very comfortable, no real excessively muddy trails, etc. So the extension is a bit gung-ho, you know, you've got to you got to want those birds, but you get back to Tarapoto, put your clothes in the laundry, have a nice shower, and you've got some great birding stories to tell, and some hopefully some great memories of a, you know, pushing your limits slightly for a couple of days. But from Tarapoto on, we spent the first few days around Tarapoto, and we are still in the Amazonian lowlands here. You know, we can find birds like hoats in here, and indicators of you know how low we are at the edge of the Amazon basin. Uh, we go down to an area south of the town one morning called Quebrada Upakiwa, which is a, a semi-deciduous forest on poor soils where we can find Zimmer's antbird. Uh, this is a, uh, again, quite recently uh, split, I guess. Um, people realize the calls are completely different and um, it's uh, an interesting bird and an indicator of those habitats. That area is also quite good for the sort of the Buckley's forest falcon. It can be a bit tricky to see like all forest falcons, but sometimes we get nice views like this. And it's also home to a critically endangered primate, the San Martin Titi monkey. And so we have a morning down in this area getting some really nice birds. We spent a lot of time up on a, a ridge just above the town of Tarapoto called the Cerro Escalera. And it's the only place in Peru you can see Plumbius euphonia. Again, this is another indication that this is an outlying ridge coming out of the Andes. It's a, it's a strange place because it's got more Andean species on it than perhaps Cordillera Azul, but it's also got these sort of isolated birds, etc. It's a very good place for the magnificent white plumed ant bird, one of my personal favorites. Uh, it gives us our first chances of Andean cock of the rock the local subspecies with the very pale blue eye. It looks whitish, but is actually very pale blue. And one of our big target birds in this area is Kepke's Hermit. Uh, this is a bird that's endemic to Peru. Although it's found from southern Peru and Manu National Park, etc., it's, it's very patchily distributed up the eastern Andes of Peru, only found on these outlying ridges. Uh, quite a straight bill for a hermit and these lovely cinnamon tail tips to all but the central tail feathers there. Well, we're waiting for that bird. We often pick up Gould's jewel front and just up the hill there is a, a nice lek of golden-headed mannequins we can go and see. And the, the it's a little reserve there and the caretaker sort of guard of the reserve often knows where there might be a roosting owl or a roosting potu. Uh, quite often he's as well as a long-tailed potu, which is one of the, the more difficult potus to see. Um, we sometimes get lucky with one at the roost there. We then leave the area of Tarapoto behind and head slightly further to the west and slightly further up. On the route, we make a stop uh, at a little roadside canyon to look for oil birds. And uh, it's a, a easily accessible, you, you're standing right on the edge of the road looking over this bridge down into the canyon and there's oil birds on these ledges. It's, it's quite fantastic. So we moved up to the town of Moyobamba now. Uh, this is in the, the Mayo River Valley. Mayo means river in Quechua, so it's the, it's the Rio Mayo, which means the river river. But uh, it's a very interesting geological area. It's a kind of, it's a microcosm of the Amazon basin, basically elevated up to about 900 meters elevation. Uh, with patches of really weathered pores, white sand soils, uh, ancient volcanic, granitic volcanic domes sticking up out of them, and steep surrounding hillsides um, 
which offers a staggering number of habitats and birds. We stay in a delightful little family run lodge, which has a fantastic hummingbird garden, the star of which is the flirty rufous crested coquette, um, which just buzzes around and delights everyone. But while we're there, we'll see uh, perhaps 15, 17 species of hummingbird, including birds like blue-tailed emerald, uh, velvet-fronted brilliant. One day we'll head up to some rice fields for a bit and we'll build an area of wetlands, uh, tiny remnant areas of wetlands in the rice fields for so widespread but sought after birds like blackish rail, uh, the masked duck is often a popular one, the rare black-billed sea finch, and um, the highly desired black-capped Donacobius. So those are all in these remnant wetlands. The rice fields itself are, are very good areas for other birds and we'll keep an eye out for spotted rail. We can see this at several places on the tour, but it is one of the more important birds to try and pick up on. And uh, we found this one a couple of years ago, sunning on the edge of the, uh, some rice fields there. This is an area that has also got several species of owls we're gonna try and find, uh, including stygian owl, which is a, a very good bird. We'll look for this hopefully in a day roost. If not, we might have to try and look for it at dusk because it comes out of its day roost and displays sometimes. Or as a last resort after dinner, we sometimes head into town and look for uh, the birds. They sit on uh, radio antennas above the fire station and things and hunt bats, which can be quite fun. But while we're looking for this, we may pick up some other good owls like black banded owl, and um, with a little walk above the lodge, we may be able to find the foothill screech owl. This used to be considered, it's also been called Napo screech owl and was once part of the vermiculated screech owl complex. So heading on, leaving the lower Mayo Valley, we're heading on to uh, an area called Abra Patricia. And the Abra Patricia area is the birding mecca of Northern Peru. It's the most diverse area. It's where, it's that, it's basically these forests that you can see on the map there, a large area of forest that are the protecting the headwaters of the Mayo Valley, which is a very important rice producing area. So these are now protected to protect the source of that. And so it gives us a gradient of forest from about 800 meters up to uh, over 2,000 meters of continuous forest on the extreme northern end of the eastern Andes, the east slope of them. Um, right at the bottom of it, there is a, an area, a, a lovely little reserve run by a, a, a delightful local man has set it up. And it's called the, the Arena Blanca, the White Sand Reserve. And it's, he set up this ingenious feeding system uh, with uh some birds on it with several birds that come to it including rufous breasted wood quail which is normally a really hard bird to see but from his little blind you can see that uh little tinamou can be seen here cyneris tinamou he also has a a nice hummingbird garden which is one of the best places um to see wire crested thorntail a fantastic hummingbird but moving on from here, the area we've really come here for is this amazing forested area along the North Amazonian uh, road. And the, the road here, nice asphalt road that will travel up and down, uh, not too transited by traffic, fortunately, um, provides access to the complete range of habitats between uh, sort of 900 meters and 2,200 meters. And we'll spend several days burning our way up here, um, trying to pick up mixed flocks in the different altitudes, etc. And one of these, so here I put up a paradise tanager to represent these mixed flocks. This can be some of the most exciting birding on the planet. And a bit my talk today is, is trying to replicate the experience of watching one of these neotropical mixed flocks where you've just got trees with multiple species charging through 
um, one after the other, after the other, after the other. And, it, you know, I don't have actually that many photos of them because it's, it's something that you cannot do. And you've got to keep just birding and birding and birding. So you can't take photos and keep watching 40 or 50 birds jumping around in the trees in front of you. Um, I've seen flocks of up to 200 birds of 40 species. So this is the talks kind of themed on that slightly, trying to give you the impression of just continuous birds. Um, but a lot of those birds are tanagers, these brightly colored tangara tanagers are our, uh, a core element to those mixed flocks. Um, we also look for some of the more sought after understory birds here, one of the smallest puff birds, the lanceolated monklet can be found along there. And when we get up to about 1,800 meters, we reach a series of old, uh, again, weathered rocky ridges, a place called Garcia. And this is where we will find a, a number of species that were only described to science in the mid 1970s. As this road was being put through, people could finally access these habitats. And we'll look for the, the Royal Sun Angel. On one of the previous tours, we found the first ever nest of this species. Um, it's a really, the photo doesn't do it justice. It's a deep royal blue with greenish tinges, etc. but it all seems to come out black in the photos. Um, but a really impressive hummingbird. Um, but it's these, it's these forests up here, you know, on these steep slopes present somewhat of a challenge to get into. But now there are a number of uh, lodges and trails and things that we can use and uh, we'll make a special effort um, to get in there. We spend three nights at a very nice lodge run by an environmental NGO here that's protecting forest along the road here uh, and particularly go and look for the long whiskered owlet. Uh, we have to walk a couple of kilometers down a well-made trail and wait in, as, at dusk for it to start calling and then hopefully see it. It's always a bit nerve-wracking especially as a tour leader you know we do have three nights to have goes on um but it's always nice to get it under the belt uh, one thing we don't want to hear while we're um waiting though is the sound of this <laughs> this owl we'll try and hopefully see it later on the rufous banded owl if that starts calling nearby then the long whiskered owl uh, just shut up because it's presumably a potential predator um, but hopefully after we've got the long whiskered owl in the bag, we can head off and try and see Rufus banded owl. And another very good owl here is the cinnamon screech owl, uh, a very strange distribute, very patchy distribution up the most humid areas of the easternmost Andes, all the way up to kind of northern Colombia, but very localized. And this is one of the better places to see it. In the daytime, uh, these forests hold a good group of ant pitters and we'll put in a lot of effort to look for, this is a very localized endemic again, one of those birds only discovered in the mid 70s here, the ochre fronted ant pitter, tiny little gralaricula. There's now a feeding station where they're feeding a pair which has improved things before it was a bit more stressful. Uh, rusty tinged ant pitter, another localized endemic uh, as is um, also chestnut ant This is one of these birds that has just been split in this new paper. This is, we still see here the, the traditional chestnut ant form, the newly described species of further south. We'll spend a bit of time, hopefully, if the weather conditions are right, looking for raptors and may be able to find montane solitary eagle. And, um, but a lot of our time here will be looking for tanagers, including perhaps with luck, the the white cap tanager, which is unlike any other tanager, goes around in monospecific flocks, very noisy, flying long distances over the canopy, jay-like call, a fantastic bird. Um, red hooded tanager is probably easier here than it is almost anywhere else. Um, and one of the most sought after is the fabulous yellow scarf tanager, which we can often find right around the lodge in the stunted elfin forest on the ridges there. Amongst the tanagers, there's also other birds that aren't called tanagers. This is this bluish flower piercer. Um, but we won't forget the understory. We will make a special effort to try and find the bar-winged wood wren, another bird only described in the 70s, and confined to very stunted, very dense, scrubby forest um, on very poor soils, on white sand soils. It's a very strange bird. Um, constantly moving um, to almost did very well to get this photo 
Um, and then in the bamboo areas, we'll look for Lulu's or Johnson's toady tyrant, another very restricted range endemic. The hummingbirds here are fantastic, as well as Royal Signs. We've got green fronted lance bill, for example. Uh, here, a long tailed sylph of the local subspecies is having a discussion about cloud forest politics with a uh, buff thigh puff leg. Um, Chestnut breasted coronet is common at the feeders around the lodge, as is white bellied wood star trying to slip in uh, unnoticed by the others. It's also a great spot, uh, our first chance on the tour, to pick up uh, the sword billed hummingbird. Here, a female with a little white ear spot as well, and the more sort of speckled underneath. And bronzy inca here, one carrying a big load of pollen. Um, other cloud forest birds like trogons are around and we, we get really a staggering list in our, our four days birding this area, which, you know, whatever, uh, however many days you've got, it never seems quite enough, but usually we manage to get most of the things we're looking for. We're then going to jump a little further east again to near the, the town of Poma, uh, La Florida, Pomacochas, by a lake called Pomacochas. We're now into uh, in the next ridge over of mountains called the Cordillera de Colan. Uh, by the lake, we'll look for Puna snipe. Uh, apparently, it's an undescribed subspecies here, um, but we usually manage to find some of those. And then the next morning, we'll take perhaps the, the sort of toughest walk of the tour is up a, onto the San Lorenzo Ridge, up a, a trail covered in wooden uh, uh, stone steps that have been built by the local community. To get a bit higher in altitude to look for the pale billed amphitheater. This is one of the world's largest amphitheaters. Um, this is the only easily accessible site to see it. And it's it's a it's a challenging walk, but you know, we take our time to do it, see some other birds along the way, and and people, you know, everyone who I've ever really tried to do it with me has always made it. And um, we usually get the bird with the exception of last year when unfortunately it was absolutely pouring with rain and we had to take herd only. Um, then we drop down and right around our, our lodge where we're staying here is um, the best place to look for one of the most sought after birds in northern Peru, the fabulous marvellous spatula tail, only, the only hummingbird in the world with four tail feathers and these fantastic large spatules. This tour is timed carefully to get there when the spatula tails, males, should have grown the tail feathers again. Some other tours go earlier in the year, but there's a good chance you would not see a male with a full tail. And so we've chosen the date. We get a slightly more rain perhaps, but we do get to see hopefully a spatula tail with a, a good tail rather than one with a half grown one because it is a totally spectacular bird. So there are also a lot of other Andean birds around this area like this sickle winged one. From there, we jump on, on a few hours across to the town of Jaén at the Lower Moranian Valley. And we do a one night stop here just to get some special birds. The first bird we usually stop for as we're arriving at sort of lunchtime is the little Inca finch. This is the first of the five Inca finches we'll look for. It's one of the shyer ones. It's quite tricky to see. It always seems to find a branch between it and you. Um, uh, but we usually get it. We make sure we look for it as one of our first stops. Well, we're looking for it. We usually pick up spot-throated hummingbird, which is another endemic. Uh, then in the afternoon and the following morning, we'll look out some of the other special birds around here, including the fabulous Moranian crescent chest. Um, this is also a good area for yellow-cheeked beckard or green-backed beckard. It's a more widely distributed bird, but um, this is one of the better areas to see this bird that can be quite scarce in other areas. Um, we should get our first buff belly tanagers here, another Moranian endemic. We will see more of these, but we usually get the first ones here. Likewise with our first Moranian thrushes of the trip. The rice fields and areas around here, the, the, the wires along the side of the road are a good perching area for pearl kite. And that's always an appreciated bird. Absolutely beautiful if you get good scope views of that, the, the subtle peachy color on the face and things, one of the best little raptors around. So then we backtrack slightly to the town of Pedro Ruiz and drop south into the Utcubamba Valley. This is a, a side valley off the Maranian Valley. So it's got some of those Maranian endemics, 
but it also offers us a chance to get slightly higher up into some slightly different cloud forest and things. Um, as we go up the river valley on our way back, we take time to look out for fasciated tiger heron, which like these rocky uh, foothill rivers. Uh, and torrent dark, here's the male, the delightful bird, and uh, the beautiful female. I, I think it's even got a better plumage than the male. I love that brick red color. Um, we also take time to visit one of the most important archaeological sites in northern Peru, which is the uh, Citadel of Cuela. This is a stunning site that, in my opinion, rivals Machu Picchu. It's much less visited, although there is now a new cable car which which helps get there quicker. Um, and it's, it's a staggering fortress on a hilltop with walls up to 17 meters high with um, lots of these dwellings. This is the only one they've restored and put the original type roof back on. The rest are in ruins, but there's hundreds of them on this, this hilltop. And we take a local archeological guide who will explain it a little bit to us. But we also, because they haven't cleared all the forest, it's a great area for birding. And so as we're wandering around this beautiful place, we look out for purple-throated sun angel. And um, just by the little food stalls and things in the forest behind there, there's often a good chance to see chestnut-crowned amphitheater. Dropping down to our little lodge, uh, family-run lodge in the valley below, there's quite often Kekki screech owl roosting in one of the exotic pine trees in the garden. Or if we don't find it there, then we wait for dusk and hopefully find one hunting in the sort of more natural habitats around. Um, we then head on up the valley a little bit and a little bit higher, a little bit more humid to the town of Laimiabamba, which is our first real sort of Andean field town. Um, and here we look for the local subspecies of rainbow star frontlet, one of my absolute favorite hummingbirds, uh, just mind boggling the colors on its, its head. It's also another chance for marvellous spatula tail here. It, it, should we need it, we never have, but they are in the area. Uh, but it's also a good spot for the rare and local little wood star. Here's a male with a nice red throat. And here's the delightful female with her cinnamony, gingery underparts and tail tips. This is an absolutely tiny hummingbird, uh, only just bigger than the bee hummingbird from Cuba, probably the smallest um, hummingbird I think by weight in South America, tiny little thing. There's a side valley off up here called the Rio Atuen which is a nice rocky river running up through forest. It's a great place to look for a white cap dipper, the only dipper that doesn't dip. They just crawl along the edge, they never actually go in and dip. Um, so that's a, that's a fun bird to look for but the, the forests here these amazing cloud forested hills um, have some really good birds in, including some of the sort of big sought after frugivores like golden headed quetzal, uh, the, the fabulous white collared jay, a sort of unbelievable blue color, and the slightly ridiculous gray breasted mountain toucan. Just a, a bit higher up as we head up to a, a high pass above Limebamba, we find birds like grass green tanager and other mountain tanagers, and also the localized endemic coppery metal tail here at its most northern point. Likewise, the Taxanowski subspecies of many striped canistero, a possible future split. This is only found this side of the, so to the east of the Moranian Valley, and is, um, is quite localized, but this is a good spot to find it. We also find some sort of high Andean birds here as this is a 3,600 meter pass like uh, moustache flower piercer. But then we drop rapidly down again into the mid Moranian Valley at the little uh, town of Balsas. And this is a staggering thing. This is going over near the top of the pass, looking down into the valley we're about to drive down into. When we get to the bottom, it looks like this totally different cactus covered hillsides and this more sort of humid gallery forest along the side streams and the main river itself. Uh, we've just come from those ridges that you can see up in the distance. Um, here one of the big target birds is yellow-faced parrotlet, which is an incredibly rare bird now. This is the only place we can see it on the tour. Its range is restricting as Pacific parrotlet expands its range, which is 
um, doing well because of agriculture further down the Moranian Valley. But here in the Moon Moranian Valley, it, the yellow-faced parrot's holding on and we make a special effort to seek this out. Uh, we also look for our second and third Inca finches, the fabulous buff bridled Inca finch, which is my personal favorite with that lovely little mustachial stripe. And this is one of the most confiding of the Inca finches. We can often get uh, good views just where we normally have our picnic lunch. Uh, then heading on up a bit more, we look for gray winged Inca finch, uh, which is a slightly more challenging, especially with, given the time of day we usually get there. But with persistence, we usually manage to find one giving its weird little high pitched call and which is kind of hard to track down, but eventually we, we find one. Uh, we also find here black necked woodpecker. This is really a flicker, but it's um, called black necked woodpecker, which is endemic to Peru and uh, reasonably common in this area. And as we get up to the higher, higher elevations, more montane scrub, we're going to seek out Jelski's chat tyrant, which is a delightful little bird, very uh, patchy little rain, small range. So this is probably where 99% of the birders on the planet have seen Jelski's chat tyrant is the area we're going to look. You know, if you don't see it there, it's going to be tricky anywhere else. Uh, we also find here the large barons form of line cheek spine tail. This has been split at some point, but it's a complicated clinal variation. Um, but it is an impressive spine tail um, to see in the same area. Here we'll start getting our first Pacific pygmy owls in this area, and we'll be using imitations of their call and some tape of their call, perhaps to to try and get some of the other birds a bit a bit excited. Then we head on to the, the highlands around Cajamarca and we're really Andean now. Uh, it's an arid area, it's grassland dominated with little forest patches. This is where we we'll look for the, the recently split Cajamarca anpida. This isn't a photo of that bird, this is stripe headed anpida. I don't have a photo of Cajamarca anpida, which now must be one of the rarest anpidas on the planet, but we usually manage to find it uh, on the tour. Also look for white-tailed shrike tyrant which is a curious bird, large global distribution, but very patchy. I don't understand why it's so patchy because it seems to tolerate very disturbed habitats at time. It likes pine plantations, etc. but it's very patchy, but this is a good area to see it. And then we'll go to the Rio Chonta Valley for another one of our big targets on the tour, the gray-bellied comet. This again, must be one of the rarest um, hummingbirds on the planet now. I suspect that you know, the, it's a handful of pairs in this area. There must be some other populations somewhere, but uh, we, no one's really managing to find them. So really very restricted now. Uh, while we're waiting for this bird, we usually pick up another endemic, the black metal tail, uh, which is more common and occurs in the sort of, the areas we'll be looking along the stream for, for the comet. This is an area where we all get, so get some of those high, typical high Andean fernerids like striated earth creeper and white winged synclodes. As we leave Cajamarca we go over a high pass which is our, our chance to find the fourth Inca finch of our Inca finch odyssey. Uh, this is the rufous back, this is the largest of all the Inca finches, it's quite tricky but um, we've got a spot that's proved reliable for the last couple of years for this bird now. Um, so, and then we're heading down to the coast. So we drop down to the coast and head up the Pan American Highway to the lowlands near Chiclayo. And here it's the Pacific Ocean. It really is quite peaceful usually. Um, incredible fishing out there for the people and also incredible congregations of seabirds. There's seven species of tern and gull in this photo alone. We see these staggering flocks of them on the coast. Uh, looking offshore with a bit of luck, we may be able to pick up a waved albatross. Uh, if we're lucky, it's useful to have scopes for that. Um, we'll also see lots of Peruvian boobies and look for a few blue-footed boobies here because we've got the, this is, we're just south of where the cold Humboldt current meets the, the warm Panamanian current waters and so you get both species. We'll try and find the Peruvian tern though. This is a rare bird now and it's, it's always tricky along the coast here. Well, it's tricky everywhere actually. Um, and we should find some of the sort of more southern seabirds of this current, like the belchers or band-tailed gull. One of the most common birds here will be the impressive Peruvian pelican. Uh, we should see hundreds going past offshore. 
Um, inland, we get this very arid coastal desert, uh, coastal miner, one of the more common birds here, almost pipit like, uh, with lesser nighthawk here with a, a couple of days old chick poking out from under its wing. And the, with, a, with luck, this is a tricky one, but with luck, we pick up some tawny throated dotterel of the pallidus subspecies. Um, interesting, they've all got black feet, as do the nominate subspecies which is not shown in any of the field guides really until recently. They all painted them always with pink feet. Um, also, least seed snipe here, uh, difficult some years, um, so more common other years. Uh, you know, it's one we make an, an effort to search for, but it's not guaranteed. Um, and we also find the smallest and shortest build subspecies of Oasis hummingbird, the Kepki, Kepki eye, um up here and Peruvian pipit, which is uh, a recent split from yellowish pipit, uh, loves the areas just inland from the beach where you've got sort of saline grasslands. We'll also make a special effort to try and find some Peruvian thickney. This is the regional bird of Lambayeque, this area, and a good area to look for them. This is an area that had incredibly rich cultural history. This is um, adobe pyramids at Tucume. You can see they're absolutely massive. Um, they're, these are 700 or so years old, so they've eroded away with multiple rains and El Nino years, etc. But it really is quite fascinating culturally. And around those, we'll look in this groundwater fed uh, mesquite forest, which we're going to look for a couple of special birds, including the Peruvian plant cutter, which is really endangered now. To my, in my mind, it's one of the most threatened birds in Peru. And um, also the Rufus flycatcher. We then jump in land a little bit more to the area around the Chaparri Ecological Reserve. This is Chaparri Mountain. It was considered very sacred by the Mochique culture, um, an impressive mountain. And the lodge is uh, built just below the mountain. I think it's a fantastic lodge because I partially designed it and helped set it up. So, um, but it's a very comfortable place. We have a local guide from the community. This is Tomas with this group. It's one of a number of young keen local birders who really know where everything is and this is the important habitat here is this little strip of permanent green in a very arid landscape outside of reserves these are almost always full of people dogs cattle etc and so there's very few of these low riverine strips protected and this is home to the the globally threatened white wing guan the reserve now this year's survey showed 99 individuals living in the reserve um, and so it's really quite a common bird there now because it's fully protected and, and thriving. We keep an eye on the sky for Andean condors which breed on the mountain and can be seen cruising over with a bit of luck. Here we'll try and pick up, we'll find a lot of um, Tumbesian endemics including Tumbes hummingbird, the fantastic Tumbes tyrant which depends on ungrazed understory so it's quite difficult to see outside this and a couple of other reserve areas now. The lovely Tumbes sparrow, and the tiny little short-tailed woodstar, perhaps the smallest bird in length, I think it just beats the, uh, the little woodstar because its tail is virtually non-existent, uh, red mast parakeet and a chance to get our second crescent chest of the trip, the elegant crescent chest. Uh, Baird's flycatcher, a classic sound of the dry forests here, lovely dusk song we hear. Uh, tawny crowned, or as a recent split was proposed, that this would be tawny fronted pygmy tyrant. Uh, the white headed brush finch is here. And some more widespread species, but of endemic subspecies. This is an undescribed subspecies of striped owl uh, with orange eyes. All the other subspecies have dark eyes. Uh, Pacific. Uh, Hornero, which was split from pale legged Hornero. And um, one morning we'll go with our coffee and look at the hummingbirds bathing in the nearby stream, and you should see lots of uh, purple collared wood stars. The, the feeders at the lodge provide great photo opportunities for things like white tailed jay and collared ant shrike, um, maybe even streak headed wood creeper. The, there's a, the, pla the more arid plains are home. It's one of the, the most reliable sites now for looking for sulfur-throated finch. Interestingly, this bird's becoming really quite rare. Jelski, when he described it, um, uh, collected the first one and described it, he said it was one of the most abundant birds he'd ever seen. And he'd worked in Africa and presumably seen calias and stuff. So 
this must be a really common bird. It's a colonial nesting, underground nesting finch. Um, very strange bird. Uh, probably deserves to be in its own monotypic genus, actually. The area also has some good mammal opportunities, so the endemic Saturan fox, and it's one of the best places now to see Andean bear. Nearby, there's a large man made reservoir called Tinojones, uh, where we look for comb duck, a small relict, bizarre population of black faced ibis. Their ecology is different, the call slightly different, isolated on its own, it's non migratory. Um, probably deserves to be a different subspecies, but it's not described as anything yet. Raptors like savannah hawk around here, and the delightful little many colored rush tyrant can be found near the reeds in the, the around the reservoir here. Um, this is, a, I love the Spanish name of this, is the seven colors of the reeds, the siete colores de tutora. Um, then we head up onto the west slope, a little bit higher elevation, up to a nearby village called Casape, we'll head up one more early one morning and have a, a field breakfast. Um, and while we're eating our breakfast, often there's Ecuadorian trogon calling. And we'll look for a suite of other birds, um, Tumbesian birds, one of my all time favorite birds, Chapman's Antrike, just such a beautiful marked bird. Um, again, shared with Ecuador, but confined to these sort of ridge areas of slightly more humid forest within the dry forest area and quite localized. Um, Ecuadorian piculate can be found up here, as can the recently described uh, or recently split from Great End Hermit, the Porcuya Hermit. Um, there's a couple of leks up there that we can visit. Uh, three banded warbler is an endemic uh, restricted range species that uh, dominates the, the, the sort of arboreal flocks here, and uh, grey and gold warbler is an understory warbler. So then we make a, a longish drive, but down the Pan American Highway, so it's a pretty good drive, down to the area of Trujillo. Just as we're arriving, uh, we make a stop on a, a isolated hill about 40 kilometers north of town, which is the northernmost point where you can find the endemic Cactus Canistero, and where we try to get our fifth uh, Inca finch of the trip for the cleanup of the endemic genus Inca Spisa, and this is great Inca finch. Um, so then the next morning we make an early start and head up to into the western Andes again to look for to a town called Sinsicap. It used to be a real odyssey of a trip up a terrible road, but fortunately they have now asphalted the road and it is much easier. And so we nip up there and have a field breakfast while watching birds like pied crested tick tyrant. Uh, there's been quite a lot of discussion over the years of Cincicap hummingbird. This is it. It is just a speckled hummingbird, but it is a, a very large pale one and undescribed subspecies. Um, we'll also hopefully see bay crown brush finch, another Tumbesian endemic brush finch. Uh, the very localized unicolored tapaculo is quite common here. But one of our main target birds here is the fabulous russet bellied spine tail. This is known from a few sites on in really quite remote sites in the western Andes of Peru, endemic. It was one of the last birds in northern Peru that I managed to eventually get there to see because it was such an odyssey of a trip before they put the, the fix the road properly. Um, and then also Pura Chap Tarrant is another endemic that we'll look for in that area. So just to give you an idea, that's the end of the tour. Um, it's been a bit of a whistle stop. We finish up with a lovely lunch before our flight back to Lima right on the coast uh, watching gulls and terns etc. Um, but these are the totals we've had in the years Rock Jumper has been running this tour. We've gone adjusting the itinerary trying to sort of improve it as we go along um, and you can see we're now getting over 700 birds seen on the tours in the last couple of years which is a staggering number including good numbers of endemics and near endemics in amongst those um, so it really is a staggering number this is the total numbers of for example 16 rails on the list over those tours 126 tonnage 151 flycatchers i told you the flycatchers would be a seller um, so that's the main tour. I'd just like to take a moment to talk about, uh, Keith mentioned it in the introduction, yellow-browed toucanet. Um, I walked a long way to see this bird. It is not a bird that will ever be offered by any tour company on a regular tour. There is no road going into its world range, um, but this and a few other birds, not all of them as hard as this, 
could be reached through tailor-made tour options. You'd have to be reasonably fit, but you can use mules and things for this one. But there are some others, and tailor-made could also do shorter tours, focusing on hummingbirds and things. So it's an, another thing to think about. But um, it was a fantastic trip. It was I took uh, quite a few days and saw a lot of other good birds while I was there. So, so um, yeah, I'd just like to thank you all for listening. Thank the photographers Thomas Heinz and Heinz for sharing a few photos where I needed to, didn't have species and I hope to see you in northern Peru soon. Oh wow that is amazing thank you so much I'm getting so many com compliments coming in um, we have Andrew that's saying that is really fantastic webinar I'm fired up for South America birding thank you and um, that's uh, and that's from RJ and Rob um, so a couple of questions that are coming through. Thank you so much. So please send them through to the Q&A and, and, and not the chat in case I miss it. Uh, the very first one is uh, Sherry is asking about what vaccinations are needed or required. Uh, Peru does require yellow fever. Um, they don't know. They, they no longer seem to check this, but it is a it is a requirement. They say yellow fever should be. Um, and really that and then just your normal things. It's it's a you know, it's a low risk area for many of the other tropical diseases. Um, South America is much safer um, in many ways than other continents in that respect. And um, no, I think yellow fever would be the only vaccination we would really make, need okay. to make sure you have. Thanks. So Mark is asking on a trip like this about what percentage of the species would be uh, an average, or, uh, the participant would see on average. Um, most of them, I, I, especially tips I lead, um, I believe we've really got to try and maximize um, people seeing the birds. And so, yeah, I would hope you will see 95% plus. I mean, there's always one or two that pop up, the leader calls it and it disappears <laughs> and you can't get it back. That, yeah. That's always going to happen. And so, you know, someone may have been lucky to see it. But no, I would, I would hope that most people on my trip see the vast, vast majority of the birds. Oh, fantastic. How many hummingbird species is one liking, uh, likely to see on this tour? I think last year we got 70, if I remember right. Um, but yeah, about, about 70 on the, on the scheduled tour, 65 to 75, I would say. And um, best birding guide, field guide for Northern Peru? If there's only really one option, I've got it here, it's Birds of Peru. This is the British edition. The North American edition is by Princeton and it's got a black cover but the same two birds on it. Um, and it's, it was published in 2007, so it's slightly out of date from a taxonomic point of view. There is an app version available that is more up to date from taxonomic point of view, but when they get a split, they tend to remove the illustration and just have the name and a little text description, etc., because they don't know which one it is. So um, there are rumors of a new app coming, which could be could be even better. But I, I personally really like this book. It was um, pioneering and is still very relevant. And uh, there's something nice about holding a book as well. How how can we get uh, Rob's hummingbird book? Uh, well, it, when it's published, it will be available from Princeton University Press in the United States and Bloomsbury in Europe. And so hopefully, hopefully next year. <laughs> so. If, um, and, uh, uh, Johnny is asking, if we aren't up for a trip quite this adventurous, is there another trip uh, you do off Peru? but not as ambitious, you know, good accommodations, easier hikes, safer roads, also prefer a trip where the altitude is not an issue. Maybe that's this, is, this actually, this has the main tour here. The, the extension is very adventurous here, you know, four wheel drives, muddy trails, etc. The, the main tour of Northern Peru is almost all on asphalted roads. Uh, the hikes are not strenuous in the main. There are one or two exceptions, which um, sometimes I've, I've, or almost always, I have someone who says, you know what, I'm going to stay at the lodge by the hummingbird feeders this morning. I don't want to walk up that trail to try and look for that amphitheater. Yeah. 
Um, but generally speaking, and this is the lowest elevation, um, you know, we are, we are going over 3,600 meters, but just very briefly, we don't sleep above 2,700 meters on this tour. Um, the central Peru tour and the southern Peru tour do go to higher elevations than that as well. Um, thank you, Harold. Uh, he, he said great, great talk. And Marcia also says great talk. Thank you. She went to North Peru, um, but it looks like she needs to go back because uh, she <laughs> missed quite a bit. So it's now you know who time. to travel with. And um, uh, there's another one here. How many days are needed for yellow brown uh, 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 to, to tourniquet net and my extension? Um, uh, yellow brow to connect you could do it in six days okay All but right. it would be a shame to do it in six days um because you would just travel basically and um you know there are so many other good birds on the way yeah and so i would say if you could do eight days you'll get so much more out of it um, you, you could probably do it in five days if you really were willing to, to push it a bit. Um, you can go most of the way on a mule. I walked because I prefer walking to riding mules. It's better for birding. Um, but you can go most of the way on a mule. But the last uh, yeah. 10, 11 kilometers each way, the mules can't do because it's in, it's in a steep forested area. And it's yeah. a good trail. Um, but it is. Do you get purple-backed sunbeam on this uh, on this particular tour? We don't do it on this particular tour. It could easily be added as an extension from Trujillo, um, which is where the tour ends. So you could easily stay there and you could drive the next morning up to the purple-backed sunbeam place. The road, again, has just been fixed. It's probably, I've not done it in a day, but I... Yes, you must be able to do it in a day, a longish day trip um, from Trujillo uh, because it's asphalted road the whole way to, to the site now. Yeah. Where do you fly into and then how do you get uh, to the starting point of the tour? You fly into a town called Tarapoto, which there are something like six flights a day from Lima to Tarapoto. And uh, from Tarapoto, you will be picked up by one of our transfer people if you come ahead of the tour and people are still on the extension or something. That extension also starts from Tarapoto um, and you'll get taken to the local hotel that's about two miles from the airport, which is where we stay for the first three nights. A lovely hotel, good birding in the grounds, very safe and beautiful place to sort of unwind from your travel and get your eye in on the birding. And then uh, Sally is asking, please repeat the names of the cultural sites uh, shown. Um. Uh, the main one I showed was Quelap, which is K-U-E-L-A-P, and that's uh, from the Chachapoyas culture. Um, and then, then I also showed a site called Tukume, which was the Adobe Pyramid. Um, that's just north of the town of Chiclayo. There are a number of other, there's the CCAN sites there, there's the CPAN, the fabulous CPAN Museum, if you've got time near Chiclayo, and also in Trujillo, as again, at the end of the tour, some people quite often stay on and do a couple of days of cultural activities. There's a number of very important archaeological sites with some absolutely fascinating museums and things that you can do based out of the hotel we leave, we end up at the tour, you can just stay in the same hotel and do them by taxi or with a local driver. Yeah, Nancy's asking potentially um, how much overlap with birds found in Ecuador? Um, depends which bit of Ecuador you've been to. If you've been right down into the south of Ecuador, there's some overlap, um, especially in the Tumbesian region. Obviously in Ecuador, you probably haven't seen Tumbes tyrant, you haven't seen white-winged guam, Peruvian plant cutter, Rufus flycatchers, et cetera, because they don't occur there. So even in the Tumbesian region, there will be birds that you haven't seen there. Um, a lot of the other special endemics, marvelous spatchel tail, long whiskered owlet. I mean, Royal Sun Angel is in Ecuador, but it's basically inaccessible unless you're hiking up a, a very steep ridge. Um, so a lot of those birds are only in Peru. So th there is overlap, but not a, not a, a a massive amount of overlap in the specialities. 
Ian um, is asking, what is the percentage um, of success in terms of uh, finding long whiskered owlets? Uh, so far, we've had it on every tour um, that I've, I've led. And I think Forrest led one uh, the year before last and he got it as well. One year, not everybody saw it. Uh, one year, we were very unlucky that uh, um, just as it arrived, uh, a gentleman tripped and pulled on a liana that was attached to the branch it was on, and it flew <laughs> back. And then it started to pour with rain. And um, the most persistent couple of people on the tour, we got it again on the third night. Um, but we, we did have, but no, last year, we, we were lucky we got it. Uh, we didn't even try the first night because it had rained a lot and that makes the stream valley it's in the stream noise can make it very difficult so we didn't try the first night the second night we went down and we got it quite easily so um yeah touch touch wood we've always managed to get it but it's you know it's it's an area where it's a bit weather dependent and are there any military macaws in the forest cliffs there are military macaws um near the very near to where we go but they're not something we generally see um i know of a place you can go about 30 kilometers off the route to see them but it's quite a rough road so it would take an hour and a bit each way and we'd have to be there for dawn or dusk and because they come into roost there i mean we could just bump into them but um we, there are so many special birds. I mean, military macaw is a great bird, but it's it's available in other places that um, that no, we we don't usually. I think we've heard it once. No, that was that was before I worked for Rock Jumper, the private group. Um, we heard some once. Um, yeah. um, Cheryl's saying lovely pre presentation. There's actually so many um, well wishes and thank yous coming through, so I'm not mentioning thank all. Very much. There is, um, she says, how many people are needed for a custom tailor-made uh, trip? Um, well, that's actually very easy because we sometimes have one person to massive groups. So it really is dependent on you and um, who you want to travel with or if you just want to travel alone, uh, we can arrange anything. So Cheryl, um, you know, it's really open to, to that and we can discuss that with you. Um, after seeing all these, uh, Jerry's saying, oh, thank you so much. After seeing all these webinars, this is by, was far, by far the best presentation. He loved your maps. Uh, it was short and concise. Thank you so much. How many people on uh, per, per trip? Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a group of eight clients at the moment. Um, for the, well, for the last ones we've run, it has been eight. So it's eight with one leader, and then we have a, a driver with us the whole time. Um, who also he's great he he knows his birds really well so he's almost like a, a second leader it's quite often we get back to the get back to the car from looking at something and he's got a scope pointing at something he's found and so. <laughs> what time of year is uh, is this tour generally run this tour's run in early october now as i said the the timing has been set to be before the, the before the wet season but also late enough that the marvelous spatula tails have have grown their tail feathers again because you, you can do it the weather's probably better in july and august but the marvelous spatula tails all the males have shed their tail feathers then you may find a late one that's got one in or one that's grown a bit earlier but to be sure of seeing a good marvelous spatula tail late september onwards basically and how much rain could someone expect um the the barbit extension we almost always because it's on this outlying ridge in the amazon basin you get these late afternoon heavy rains quite often so you can get really torrential rain up there they don't usually last that long um uh, on the main tour we will almost certainly get some rain but we would be unlucky to get rain that really ruined birding um we were unlucky last year with the with the pale build amphitheater, we just got to the right elevation and it absolutely started throwing it down for several hours. And we waited up there under our umbrellas for it to stop and it just clearly wasn't going to, but that was, that was unlucky, you know, we, um, but we will almost certainly get some rain somewhere, but it's not going to be daily uh, in the tour. Quite often at Abra Patricia, you get late afternoon 
rains as well. And we sit in the, the lodge and watch the hummingbird feeders and have a cup of coffee. And that, that was one of the questions was, is there hummingbird feeders at the lodges? So yeah. You've just there are multiple that. hummingbird feeders that we will go to. I can think of one, two, three, four, five, six, at least six sets of hummingbird feeders that we will visit on the tour. Oh, fantastic. Um, I think that is our time. So sorry if we didn't get to all the questions, but um, thank you so much, Rob. This has been an amazing chat. Um, I can't wait to travel to Peru myself. Um, what a great destination. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very uh, special indeed. Thank you so much, uh, Rob. Thank you so much, Nikki, as well. Sorry, I was still tapping away in the, in the chat box there. Um, whilst it's all going on. Thank you so much for all the feedback, everyone. It was uh, yeah, lovely catching up with, with a bunch of you. And uh, yeah, glad to hear that you all enjoyed the presentation so much. It really was very, very special, Rob. Thank you again. Um, so yes, our Dream Destinations webinar series. Uh, we're going to continue uh, with the South American theme and we're going to head off down to Brazil's glorious Pantanal next week. Uh, Stefan Lorenz is going to be entertaining us with that one. Um, it, it really is a, a classic, classic trip. Uh, birds and wildlife just abound. And uh, traditionally, September is also a fantastic time of the year to explore uh, the sort of watery wildlife haven of the Pantanal. And uh, we just felt it was fitting to sort of showcase uh, the spectacular part of the world as a virtual tour, um, whilst we unfortunately can't travel to Brazil itself. Um, but yeah, nowhere in South America are the large mammals as prolific as the Pantanal. And it's also well regarded as the place to see uh, jaguar and uh, a bunch of other great species as well. Uh, Brazilian tapirs, giant anteaters, tamanduas, ocelots, giant river otters. Um, it's, it's a pretty extraordinary part of the world. And, and also just fantastic birding opportunities as well. And I think, um, you know, just so many large, spectacular, outrageous species that want to actually sit out and be photographed and seen. And it's, it's not a forested part of the, or not a, a heavily forested part of uh, South America as well. And, and you just got so many spectacular birds on show, sunbittens all over the show, jabiroos, hyacinth macaws, uh, you name it. It's a, a very special part of the world. And uh, Stefan is certainly going to uh, royally entertain us with that one. Some of you might remember him. He was actually the, uh, it opened up our uh, Dream Destinations webinar series with Sri Lanka uh, all those weeks ago. Uh, so then just a reminder as well that the webinars are recorded and can be viewed later and those links will be available within the next 24 to 48 hours um, should you wish to review or send that on to some friends. And, and then just another reminder as well that the webinars are all being offered free of charge but uh, should you wish to donate towards our tour leaders we have our GoFundMe link that is still open and 100% of those proceeds go directly to our guides. Um, you'll see that the beneficiary name on there is George Armistead. We've had a few questions about this. Um, George is just listed there as the main beneficiary. Um, all the money goes to, to all the guides. If you would like to donate to a specific guide um, who's done a specific webinar, as some people have, have wanted to do, uh, please just uh, email us at info at rockjumper.com we'll make a note of that for you. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for your contributions that continue to come in. It's very, very much appreciated. And um, finally, thank you to all of you for joining us again today. I uh, really look forward to seeing you again next week, uh, Wednesday, um, at the same time. And from all of us at Team Rock Jumper, thank you and goodbye.